Hour two overdrive continues live from the RBC Canadian Open. Brian Hayes, the O-Dog, Jeff O'Neill, Jamie Noodles, McLennan, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. There's a shot up on TSN 2 of the 14th green. Sun is out. Lots of people here. A lot of people in a very good mood. A lot of people looking great to get after it tonight. Great golf fans here. Canadians are great golf fans. Yeah, they're, they're having yeah. a good time. They're having a bunch of beers. Nobody's disrespectful. Nobody's being stupid. No. Just great. And Sands, he talked about it yesterday. Thanks again to Steve Sands. Great guest. Have him on any time. We were supposed to go see him today at 2.30. We never did. Yeah. But he talked about the great Canadian fans. Everyone's having a good time. Nobody's being stupid. Right. Perfect. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Is like, it's this is one of the oldest tournaments in the world. And, you know, it's a tournament that I think a lot of Canadians are proud of. A lot of if you're a diehard golf fan, like, this is obviously amazing. But it, it, it doesn't matter if you are a golf fan. Like, you just come up and you pick up on the vibes. You're walking around. You're seeing different people. It's just right. kind of a party up here. And, and they got great concerts going on this weekend. Oof. Black Eyed Peas, Alanis Morissette. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be it's a great little setup. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, Keegan Matheson coming up here in a few moments from the Dome. Jay's back in action tonight. You say Kikuchi now with the pressure to roll it over, right? Yeah. Roll it over because Barrios pitched well last night. Bassett was outstanding the night before. And Gosman was basically perfect the night before that. And now it's on Kikuchi before you go into a scenario tomorrow where we don't know who's going to start. Yeah, and I, w I would assume they'll announce that probably today, tonight. We'll find out. But Schneider was asked, he's always asked, what's the reason for the success? And he always gets to one major point. You get started pitching like that, you're going to have a chance yeah, to exactly. win. Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. You get like a gas pitching. can out there that's letting, uh, like, that gives up six in the first, you're screwed. Yeah. You're done. You don't have yeah. a chance. It's like getting off the tee. Like, if you can't get off the tee, you're just going to have a horrible day. You're just chopping and slashing, and, and maybe miracles happen for you. But that's what the starting pitching represents. Yeah. If you get a pitcher like Gosman doing what he's doing, Bassett, it's 300 down the middle every single time. And then it sets up the whole – everything else, offense, defense. Like, defensively, they've, they, they're playing well, man. Like, Kiermaier took that pitch off the wrist last night. He is – like had such an immediate impact on this club. Yeah. Like the good. way he plays center field is phenomenal, but he's been hitting really well. Um, Base running unreal. Absolutely. Like he is a gamer. Like he is. Yeah. And belts coming alive too. Like those were the two guys that they brought in, like veteran guys who have been around the block, who have won a lot in their careers. And, you know, belt coming from San Fran, Kiermaier from Tampa. And Kiermaier's hit the ground running. Belt, it took a while. But Bell, like he had a big hit last yeah, night. Yeah, he's starting to settle in. Yeah, absolutely, like it's, and that's precisely what they were looking for. Vladdy on D too. He Vladdy's, continues to. He's a stud, man. I, I he continues to impress me defensively. Like he's, he's got KG little plays. Like he knows what he's doing. Yep. Uh, you know, I I think he's fantastic, and he's kind of a treat to watch. Like I always thought that, you know, his hitting and his offense was really going to be all about him, but he's got a complete game there. He does. No, they've. It was like everyone knew when he was coming up. He wasn't staying at third base. You almost yeah. look back on it now. They're like, what were they even thinking? Like that's just to make him feel good, butter him up, give him a chance to play third. But he was always going to play first base in yeah. his career. And and you know he's he's playing well, man. He's and yeah. you know Bichette continues to do what he's doing. The Jays are in a good spot. You know the the Rays probably gone. Like that's not who you're you're talking about anymore. But in terms of the wild card pursuit for June 9th. I think right. the Jays feel really good about where they're at, and I, I think they should. And and recently, in particular, the way they played last weekend, taking three or four against Houston, and now you got Minnie in town, who's a good team, but the Jays are going to be in a good spot. They're favored again tonight. Like, there's no reason you can't take two out of three against Minnie, and then yeah. you're really starting to cruise. And uh, Keegan Matheson will join us here in just a moment. But you know, the news of the day, the Anthony Bass stuff. He's been designated for assignment. He was going to catch the ceremonial first pitch. It's Pride Weekend down there at the Dome. Now Gosman is going to step up and do that. And I'm I not, don't know. I don't know what that's. It just looks like sounds like a mishandling on all different kinds of levels. I don't. I don't know. I don't even know what to say about it. You make one comment and everybody seems to be. I, I don't even know how to to talk about how well, that was managed. It's, it's, it's improper management the whole way through. Yeah, it's a, it's a communication thing. It's a PR. Th it's a complex, like, again, as we talked about in the last hour, t w regardless of what the actual issue is that we're, we're talking about or that someone posts about or opinion that they have, right? In, a, in the business, with the union, with other players watching what you're doing, it's not as easy as just get rid of that and it's over. Right. As much as some people might, might want that, 
it, it never is going to work that way. And I don't think it ever should work that way. Right. You have to put in due diligence. You have to figure out how you're going to handle a situation. But the way the Jays have kind of fumbled the messaging and then the idea of yesterday, it's like, well, this is where we're going with Bass, and he's coming yeah. around. And then he doubles down on, you know, his beliefs, but also, you know, the distraction stuff, which is a difficult word to use in a situation like this when it's highly sensitive. And then today he's designated for assignment. Well, and it's and it probably went up the chain. You know, I that's think that's precisely what, what happened. Again, I, I don't believe that this was a performance decision, and I don't believe Ross Atkins made the call. But Ross had to go out there and answer for it. Yeah. Here is uh, Keegan Matheson of MLB.com down at the Rogers Center. Um, how would you kind of describe the, the week of the Jays considering they've won a lot of ball games? I think they're really happy with the way they're playing, Keegan. Yeah, you got the Manoa story at the beginning of the week and now the Anthony Bass story at the end of the week. Um, as a guy that covers this team every day, how would you kind of describe the mood around the team? A, a mess that has made me forget they've even won games, frankly. That's been... Uh, not really my, my main focus most days. Uh, yesterday being a good example with Anthony Bass speaking, Ross Atkins speaking for the first time. And then you look up at the end of the night and say, oh, God, there is a game going on. They did win. But the, the focus, the public focus, very understandably, is elsewhere. This has been a mess. And when you say that it's been a week long, shouldn't have been a week long. And I think that the, the fire has been uh, attempted to be put out when 90% of the house is already burned down. Keegan, what should have happened here? I mean, I'm careful to talk about it because I don't know the exact details, when the tweet was sent, what it actually was, was it deleted? What should have happened here and handled, how, how should this have been handled properly? Yeah, so this would have been last Monday, an off day. And, and just the, the very quick context for people listening, Anthony Bass shared this Instagram post, deleted it, put it back up again because he stood by his beliefs and deleted it again. Now, this video post called organizations like Target and Bud Light supporting the LGBT plus community demonic and evil. Those are a couple of words used. So he shared that, took it down, shared it again. This could have been handled much more quickly, much more directly, like we have seen with similar situations in the past. Whether that involves internal discipline, whether that involves a move at the time, I don't know what the right answer is there. But the right answer is not to have this spread out 10, 11 days later with so much hurt that has been created within the gay community in Toronto, gay and trans community, but also within the organization. The Blue Jays are a big organization. I'm always focused on 26 players, and God, it seems like they have 26 coaches now. But this organization is massive. There are marketing people, ticketing people, advertising, fan mm -hmm. experience, many of whom who are members of this community who are not making three million bucks a year, suddenly seeing their organization protecting, it seems like, to that community for, for 10 days through this situation. It has not looked good and certainly has not felt good around the organization. Well, and, and you consider what's happened in the last 24 hours. Like when, when Bass first came out, issued a statement, and that didn't take any mm -hmm. questions, you know, understandably, I, I think that that bothered a lot of people. Like if, if this is... You know, you're going to issue your opinion and you're going to post, you know, whatever you're going to post. It's, it's your own Instagram account. I, I think there should have been some sort of an understanding that he had to speak on that or explain where he was coming from. That didn't happen. But you, you consider what was coming tonight where he was going to catch the first pitch tonight. It's Pride Weekend down there. Ross Atkins was trying to advocate for that and why that made sense, which it, it never did in retrospect. And, and now it's clearly not going to happen because Bass has been designated for assignment. And Gosman will catch that pitch tonight. But I, I said last hour, Keegan, that this is clearly not about performance, obviously. Like, he's been awful all year. Yes, his performance is it's hurting the team. But it was hurting the team on Monday when he last pitched. It's been hurting the team, you know, the last week and a half when he's been on the roster but hasn't been used. So they could have made this call at any point based on performance. It is about the topic at hand here. And I don't believe Ross Atkins is the guy that can make a call on this. I think this should have been Mark Shapiro speaking because I don't think it has anything to do with baseball and performance. Where do you stand on that? I agree. And when you are an organization that talks about values and cultures and beliefs, it's easy to do that, just like it's easy to issue a statement. Uh, that's why teams, organizations, companies, both companies we work for have HR people, have PR people. 
for those situations when you are communicating with the public, relating to the public is what PR means. So it is easy to say those things, but you have to prove it. It only matters when something happens and you have to prove it. So that is a difficult spot for the org to be in. And when you mention Ross in this as well, it's something that we struggle with covering the story, figuring out where it goes. It's uh, on a much lower level. It's like criticizing a pitching change. Is it really coming from the manager? Is it coming from the analytics department? Is it coming from the pitching coach? Where does this come from? MLB organizations are built with hierarchies, with 100 meetings full of 100 people. How high does this go? You would very clearly see that this goes all the way up. This is a massive organizational issue for the Blue Jays, who in this situation, yes, you look at them as a sports team, but also as a company, as an organization that's worth a heck of a lot of money and employs a ton of people, not just here in Toronto, but elsewhere as well. So it becomes a, a workplace and a broader company issue outside of just baseball itself. With Keegan Matheson of MLB.com. Uh, so tonight, you got Minnesota back in town. And as you've been saying, you know, throughout the week, it's it's been about, you know, the bass situation. It's been about how the handling, you know, how they've handled that, the PR kind of fumbling. Um, but after Kikuchi goes, tomorrow, it would have been Manoa. And that was the story earlier in the week. I don't think they fumbled that. I think that was the right play. He couldn't possibly pitch again tomorrow. Um, but what do you what do you make of that story? We haven't caught up with you this week, Keegan. What what is your kind of projection about the the rest of the season for Alec Manoa? Baseball wise, guys, this is as interesting a story as I've covered in years. I think because you are dealing with failure for an elite athlete here. And we see it across all sports, but I think baseball, you see it a little more often where a guy comes up through junior high school, high school, NCAA, the minors, as the best dude on the field at every level. When you are failing for the first time and you're stuck facing Aaron Judge, good luck. It's a very lonely feeling. So you are looking at not just a pitcher, but a person here, somebody who became very accustomed to success to being the guy on this team, being the opening day starter ahead of Kevin Gosman, who's an amazing pitcher. And now he is at the complex in Dunedin, surrounded by rehabbing guys, surrounded by 18-year-old minor leaguers. This has to be incredibly humbling. And at this point, guys, the point I've reached now, and I agree the Blue Jays handled the Manoa demotion, I think, properly. They gave him enough rope and then sent him all the way down. Now it has to work. You know, we talk about this like a rebuilding franchise. Oh, they'll just rebuild, get some first-round picks. It doesn't always happen. When you are rebuilding a player, my God, this has to work. And there's not much of a blueprint, not much of a path to follow. This is rare territory. But Noah's a guy I bet on, a guy I believe in fully. And if this works, it's going to be the story of the season, the return of the king coming back. But it has to work. Keegan, I think people goof on, even some members of the media goof on the players-only kind of closed-door meeting. And God knows what was said in that meeting, but you got to kind of, you got to admit since then they've kind of straightened it out, huh? They sure have. It's been fantastic since then. I remember standing outside that door in Tampa, the closed-door meeting. Uh, I don't think uh, players typically don't love when that gets out either. I think the best closed-doors meetings are one that people like me don't find out about. I know, but it's pretty tough when the doors closed and you're not allowed yeah, in. That means a the closed door's door right meeting. There. It's <laughs> right there. But and, and you guys can speak to this well as well, being in some of those meetings. I'm not uh, not quite athletic enough to be on the other side of the door, but it's worked. It has clearly worked. And it's important to highlight that when things are going as bad as they were, and it wasn't just bad, it was sloppy. It was straying from their identity. It didn't look like good baseball. It wasn't clean. It was completely against everything they had said credit to them credit to that meeting you know john schneider said at the time that it works better when players hold each other accountable not just mom and dad coming into the clubhouse and slapping them on the wrist and saying you need to be better it was about the players they've made that work they are on a very good run right now and even being on this good run they're not playing their best baseball this offense does not look as good as it has or like it could look so i think it can get even better and important to credit that. That was a turning around point, at least in terms of wins and losses here lately. Could you argue that the Manoa demotion maybe helped that as well? And what I mean by that is, you know, he seemed to be, when, when you have a teammate that is struggling, 
in that dressing room or in that clubhouse anything. No one else has to talk about it either. Well, exactly. Like you're you're watching him, and and everyone's kind of on pins and needles. And now Manoa's not in the situation. The pitchers are dynamite, and the mm-hmm. team seems to be more in sync. Could you argue? Could you argue that him being demoted maybe helped the guys to kind of settle down as well? It can be a bit of a, a wake up call. I, I think that. Even outside of baseball, that's psychology. If right. if I'm sitting next to someone in the press box and they get demoted a little bit because their stories weren't all that good, man, I'm going to write a better story that night. I promise you. Yep. It's any of us and any of us in our jobs. If we see the guy next to us go down, you are picking up the pace. And you have seen this rotation be just fantastic lately. Right through Barrios. And if Kikuchi can do the same, they are set. But that helps make up for a lack of Manoa for what could be a while. With Keegan Matheson, what do you think the plan is then? Uh, not only for tomorrow, but give us your take on how they see that plan out. But, you know, if he's if he's out of the rotation for, for a month, two months, what do you see them doing in his spot? It's going to look different every time, I think. I like simple, straightforward fixes, but that's not how baseball works now. You're going to see Bowden Francis a bit. You are going to see Mitch White. You will see Trevor Richards throw two innings. Nate Pearson throw two innings. Starting rotation depth is this organization's biggest weakness baseball-wise right now, I think. Teams don't have 10 great starters. I know that. But the Blue Jays haven't had much go right this last while. Where it gets really interesting post-All-Star break, Hunjin Ryu is targeting that as when he can come back. That would be a really cool comeback story if he can do something. But the Blue Jays are really in scramble mode with that. I think they'll use some off days to avoid this number five spot. But... They are really going to have to duct tape this together a few different ways. What's the uh, latest on, on Kiermaier? Have you heard anything in terms of where things are going to stand with him moving forward? So it looks like the x-rays and everything came out okay. He is feeling as you would imagine he would feel after taking 96 off the wrist, which yeah. is not great. Probably some mobility, definitely some swelling there. Guys always tend to stay in for one inning because the adrenaline kicks in, and then an inning later they say, hey, I just got hit by a pitch, and he comes out. So I think he is an option on the bases tonight if you need, probably back in there tomorrow. And, man, credit to Kiermaier. He has been an incredible signing. I did not think he would be nearly this valuable. He's exceeded every expectation, even offensively. He's been important. Keegan, before we get you out of here, with all the new restos and different things to eat, have you found a personal favorite? Like, let's say on a Tuesday, do you indulge in the the loony dogs or – What's the favorite new food at the barn? <laughs> you know what? We, we do get into the hot dogs a little bit. I went and explored <laughs> around. I think one of the bars in center field was described as, it's just like King West, to which I said, what the hell would I do there? <laughs> but you know what? I'm still a Mary Browns purist. You know, you can't go wrong going down to grab some Mary Browns during yeah. the ball game. Get yourself a fried chicken sandwich. Good way to live. I love it. A Dude, purist. if you can get me some i mean i'm a member of the media i'll sit beside you for one game and we'll just bury those chicken sandies all <laughs> afternoon if you want if you want a day like that i'm interested i'm in people think it's about counting hot dogs no come to the big leagues with us yeah that's you Love guys it. are playing a different different <laughs> ball game when you start knocking back fried chicken sandies i'm with you man four, I'm pack, with you. four pack for fun okay keegan enjoy yourself this weekend thank you buddy you got it, guys. Talk soon. Keegan Matheson of MLB.com. He's looking at the uh, lineup tonight. Brandon Belt, DH, and hit in third. His stats are really coming alive, man. MVP. Yeah, he's, he's been, been good. He's been outstanding. He's got his OPS up to 829. You know, he's he, he's really been clutch. That left-handed hitter, that's what they wanted. Veteran guy. I that, know, but at, yeah. at the beginning, you're like, the it was aging, ugly early. oh, the aging veteran maybe yeah. doesn't like it here. Maybe it's not working out. And now it's, he's, he's dialed in. Good. He's, he's, he's looked, looked great. Good. Him and Kiermaier have been big, big additions. They've been really, really good. So, yeah, we'll see what the Jays have uh, in store this weekend, again, with Minnesota in town. And uh, we're here at the RBC Canadian Open. A lot of people, I would suggest, are mailing it in. A lot of people mailing in the rest yes. of their days. And Millet and Fridays here on Overdrive brought to you by Boston Pizza. Weekends are better with fish bowls and frosty pints on the BP patio. Grab your sunscreen and let's have a weekend. See you on the BP patio. Dear Hazy B is going to happen. It doesn't matter if we're on the road. Dear Hazy no, B is going it. to happen. Gotta we have it. people we need to help, and we'll do that at 6.30. Graham Dillette will join us around the table. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. 
All right, we're live at Oakdale, RBC Canadian Open. Big weekend up here in Toronto. Big weekend next weekend as well, being Father's Day, right? We got a Golf Town gift card giveaway for Father's Day right. coming up at some point in the next hour, hour and a half. We're talking big time. We're talking $500 gift card. Like, Ooh. that is going to get your dad really fired up. Or you can just yeah. win and keep it yourself, I guess. That's true. But we'll get to that a little bit later on. Graham Dillette joining us around the table. What's up, GD? How are you? How are we okay. feeling, man? It's been a good couple of days so far. Pretty good couple of days. Yeah. People ask you about that stash all the time. Like, is that the first thing people ask you about? Because that thing is absolutely spectacular. Yeah. yeah, it's been kind of fun. I mean, I wore a beard to hide my face before, and now I just grow the mustache to distract him from looking at my face like <laughs> i love it yeah it's been fun yeah that's i uh, remember when you were down at the masters we're like man this guy's stash is phenomenal like it it's an icebreaker it is it's an icebreaker <laughs> i love it um so what do you make of it man what do you think of uh what we've seen so far Corey connors looks like he's the canadian to look at but there's a bunch of canadian flags sitting up there in the top 20 yeah a lot of canadians played really well today um will bateman had a good round earlier nick taylor's got a good round going on the golf Nicky course taylor was unreal he was like he, hayes was saying he was four over at one point yesterday unreal even like ha uh, had when he was three over through his first five holes and uh, now he's got it back to, what, five or six on the tournament. So yeah, a lot of Canadian flags. And, I mean, this leaderboard's still pretty tight, right? Like, no one's really run away. we got one guy at nine. And other than that, I mean, anyone who makes a cut really has still has a pretty good shot here on the weekend. Well, th this is the beauty of a golf tournament and the beauty of, of talent and the best players and why you play 72, right? Because y you look at the top of the leaderboard, and let's be honest, there's a lot of guys that people would not be that familiar with. Right. But now, all of a sudden, I'm looking, Tyrrell Hatton's eight under. Tyrrell's a guy that is a top 20 player in the world. Rory McIlroy, I believe, is up to five under. So Rory's going into the weekend, and he's chasing, and he's in a good spot. Justin Rose is five under. I would guess by Sunday, one of those three guys are in the final pair. Yeah, right? I would assume so, too. And the cream always just continues just to rise. Just keeps getting there. And, you know, especially on the weekend when the pressure starts to rise, guys who are up near the top that haven't really been there and haven't felt that very much before, uh, they tend to kind of at least not continue to go forward and sometimes come back. Well, how do they do it, though? How does it? How does the best players always seem to creep up there? Is it just like their natural ability? It comes through sooner or later? Yeah. Or they putt better or they just are they just that much better it's and they're going to show they're up? They're just better. I mean, it's just like over the, over the course of 72 holes, they're going to hit more good shots. Their misses aren't as bad. Yeah. They're up and ins. Their short game's tidy and... I mean, that's the difference. That's what makes a guy a top player in the world versus a regular PGA Tour player. And the, 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 the term in the playoffs, especially the Stanley Cup final, it's just like the margins are so thin. If you sat here like we have the last five days and watched the tee balls like going into the air, it's not that much different. Like everyone just peers it almost right at the hole. Yeah. So it's the little things after that. I mean, you I sat there. I, I sit here and watch and – some, you notice they don't, the guy they don't look the same to me. No, no. Really? Like I the mean, you can see, or what? well, no, just the way like uh, you know this wind has been kind of coming off the right. A lot of guys just kind of hold it up against the wind. Some guys hit the high one that uh, you know gets riding the wind, and then it kind of hits and rolls over the back of the green. So there's different ways and different shots that you hit, and the top players they have like that extra gear to just kind of finagle something in there just a little differently and. You know, the strike's different, the flight's different. There's just, just the total control and the sound. Who's the one guy that you watched just hit a golf ball either on the range or something, and you were just like, that sounds way different? It's than Rory, man. Like, I mean, it's it's incredible. That hit is so heavy. I remember we were at Quail Hollow in 2017 and for the PGA, and they had kind of rearranged the driving range a little bit that year just because there was such a big build-out for the tournament. And they had a fence, and it was at, like, 320. And I was smashing them and, like, getting up, like, rolling once in a while, even, like, touching the fence. And Rory's airmailing this thing. And it was, and there was, like, all these, like, semi-trucks. And, and like that's in 2017. 17, <laughs> and flying, donk, like, hitting all these trucks and stuff in the background. And, and guys are just stopping and watching. You know, it's like watching, like, For you Dave's guys skate. to stop and watch exactly. that, it must be something. It's incredible. I mean, uh, he, he's just got such a heavy hit. It's just different. And he's not a big dude, like everyone points out, yeah. but he just he swings out of his shoes and he hits like it's all about like swing speed and, and well, yeah, how he, he like uses like the earth. Like you see like Justin Thomas, too. He almost like yeah. jumps like he uses the earth to gen generate the speed as opposed to like some guys who just don't quite have that same amount of speed. They're almost just like using their upper body and their I mean, their legs are still working. But he's, like, using the earth and, like, pushing up into this golf ball and just launching it. Right. And it's going so high, right? Yeah. Like, that's – I remember Michael Block was saying that a couple of weeks ago, that this guy was hitting 
it looked like his his five iron looked like a, yeah. a nine well, iron. Well, one par three, he hit an eight and block had a four. Right, <laughs> and and also just like how high this guy hits a golf ball is absurd. Like yeah. what McElroy can do. So it's like I I tell people all the time. There's like Rory has shots that like nobody can hit, and then you see like a guy like Jordan Spieth, he hits shots that everybody can hit, but he just like gets the ball in the hole. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't do anything that like blows your mind. His short game's outrageous. Though. It's incredible. Yeah, and he puts really well. It's weird though. He's kind of become like more of a streaky putter, but his like hands around the green are incredible. But he just like he just doesn't do anything special. He doesn't hit any shots that. Every single guy out here can hit those shots, but Rory and Tiger and some of those guys that separate themselves, mm -hmm. they just hit shots that nobody else can. First thing I saw you, we had a little stop and chat when I got here, and then I asked, how was the block party? And you actually said he, he hit him pretty well today. Yeah, well, I, last I saw he was 400 through 17, so I don't know what he finished on the day, but that was good. I mean, I mean, listen. For the he, tournament? No, uh, no for, for the, the day. day. Oh, for the he's, day. He's, he's, he's packing his bags. Yeah, now, right? I mean, like, he yeah. caught lightning in a bottle at the PGA, and it was yeah. an unbelievable story. And I think he was just riding it so hard that, I mean, it was just like, it was like a movie script. I yeah. mean, we all watched it. It was incredible. Does he get more invitations from here, or is that uh, it? I think he probably will. I mean, I think the kind of the sexiness of, of it is kind of already ran its course. But, uh, I mean, I wasn't expecting much from him a colonial two weeks ago like i mean the emotions that he was going through and then all the extracurricular that he was doing off the golf course even here this week he played the monday or the u.s open qualifier at 36 holes and then he had an off-site pro-am the one day i mean you get to thursday you're almost tired and it's tough but right. that's kind of part of getting the sponsors exemptions you have things that you have to do for absolutely the tournament. they're they're gonna say well we'll bring you up but you got to bring something to the table here. Yeah. And, and uh, listen, Michael Block, it's, it is a once-in-a-lifetime story. It's a story that, that people will always remember. The legit remember movie. The course, you know, yeah, legit you know, movie, the hole-in-one, everything. You know what it reminded me of is John Scott making the All-Star game. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of similar, man. But yeah, but just, John Scott didn't deserve to be in the All-Star game. I Michael understand. Block played himself I get it. Don't get me wrong, because you guys are talking about, yeah, like his up and down and, and that, like he had the game of a lifetime or the weekend of a lifetime. Where John Scott was voted in, right. I get that, but it's just it's such an outlier. Yes. that's that's what it is yeah. in pro it's sports. It's Leicester City winning the Premiership, right? And now they've been relegated, I believe. Leicester City's literally <laughs> playing on the Corn Ferry Tour now over in yeah. uh, England. But they, when they won it all, it was like, what the hell is this? Yeah, you that's know, all I can see think it of. It's just you know, it's going to be a movie right. or going to be, but at the 15 minutes of fame is, is shrinking a little bit. Like sure. it's, it might be up right now. Sounds like McIlroy's putt for eagle on 18 to get up to seven under so it, you know there's a chance we've been short changing rory at five under I at a minimum he's going to be six under. he's not gonna i snuck a little plus 1000 in on him last did, night to win well because you got him he was what was he one under last night like yes. coming in here <laughs> yeah. so the odds start but that that's a great play because that's Thanks, what you man. need you, you're welcome man. <laughs> you're welcome congratulations yeah but you're right because the what was he pay it like plus 400 or something to like start. to and start you can't bet that i'm not in a golf tournament you, you can't and you're paying juice for like a top five which is absurd but he has a slower thursday eases into the tournament you start to get some odds yeah it's like that like it's the like when they, yeah like if vegas goes down one nothing or whatever yeah you live bet, well, on bet you get, yeah absolutely See, this guy's a genius, man. Graham Gillette knows what's I up. I love it. So, I love it. Hey, um, he, might be a, he might be a part of Team uh, Oh, I don't want to give away any secrets. <laughs> Next year come football season. Oh, 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 interesting. Oh, <laughs> all right. There yeah, is a, a yeah. really, really prominent role up for grabs right now. There certainly You're is. You're in the interview process as we speak. Um, with Graham Gillette here at the RBC Canadian Open. So, again, Corey Connors at 7 under. Will Bateman never used a blade putter. I guess he picked it up out of his truck today, went onto the practice team. I was told he hit like six 20 footers in a row and said, I'll take this. He just shot six under today. Wow. What a crazy like, game. You ever done anything like that? So one year at Palm Springs, I played the first two because they cut after three rounds. Yeah. I played the first two rounds. I was like two under or something, but that's horrible out there. You, you got to play seven under to make right. it. Right. And I was using the long putter at the time. So I was staying with Luke List and Colt Noas. I said, do you guys got another putter? I'm like, I can't do this. I couldn't hit the hole from three feet. And Luke's like, I got this two ball, but it's like 34 inches. I'm like, done. Eight under the next day with this two ball. I hadn't even practiced with it. You know, wow. it's crazy. So That's sometimes wild. just something. But did he ask for hand. it back or you said sorry? He let me keep it, yeah. But uh, <laughs> then the boys made me one and I gave it back and it didn't last long either. Is that is that um, 
you know, kind of on the norm on the tour where guys look at each other's clubs and, you know, yeah, like, sometimes. hey, let me sh you show me yours, you know, type of thing. Like, is Exactly. It Even, like, guys will, you know, go up and you're like, what kind of grip are you using there? And they kind of see, and it's like, oh, how tight are you holding? And, like, where's your overlap around? And then they go try it, and it's like, whoa. Really? You know, you play a practice round, you're like, man, I made everything. I, yeah. All I can think of, like, you guys talk about clubs at nauseam, but, like... Yeah, but there's so of, much downtime for these guys. There's saying, so like, much time on the range. How many to times just... did you look at somebody's stick? Yeah. Like, I'm watching Mark Stone on the bench last night. His knob Unreal. is, like, <laughs> it's like a hot dog <laughs> right, at the it's, end. Like, it's, it's outrageous. But <laughs> other guys pick up the, the stick and, like, how do you hold that? How do you do this? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Is it a lot like that on the tour where you're looking at somebody and it's like, that... I gotta see this. I gotta see this up close and personal. There's got to be a filter, though, right? Like you can't be the 148th yeah. player in the world. Hey, go Rory, up to Tiger. let me see your wedges. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rory, what are you playing there? <laughs> what do you got? The yeah, uh, I get it. Like, MG3 you, there. What do you 56, go, 52? I mean, even if you're a rookie on tour and you're kind of walking back, and Rory's hitting balls, you could kind of stop and watch and just kind of like pull his club. It would, that would be okay. And Rory's That's doable. Yeah. I okay, mean, what about Tiger? What if you saw Eldridge? I wouldn't. I don't know. I just Tiger's <laughs> yeah. Tiger. Tiger's different. He's on a different planet. Imagine you walked. Imagine Graham the let like <laughs> ten years ago. Just walked up the Tiger's bag, looked at his club, and went yeah. amateur hour. Yeah. 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 Mine are better. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. All yeah. right, GD. Well, you're here all weekend, man. Like, right? You guys. We saw Bobby Weeks inside the ropes, signing hats, firing signing up shirts. the crowd, firing we'll up yeah. the crowd. Yeah, I love it. Weeksy, he's a legend around here he this is. week. Weeksy is a man of the people. He Everyone is. loves Bob Weeks. Love it. Um, well, Graham, it's great to see you, buddy. Thanks for having me on. You're Carlos. off doing a uh, Sports Center hit. Yeah. Say hi to Duffy and Bob for us, and we'll catch you here, I'm sure, before we get out of here. There Will he do. is, Graham Dillette, our good buddy, longtime uh, Canadian. PGA Tour Pro and our TSN Golf Analyst joining us here around the table up here at Oakdale in the RBC Canadian Open. And um, I like his, his logic there with Rory, right? Yeah. The live betting, the adjusted odds. you got to oh. be on top of that kind of stuff. That's Now that's your guy. You guys are speaking the same language. Like that's he's a, like, ah, you know. Your ears perked up a little when bit. he yeah. said <laughs> live betting. Well, I'll bet you we'll go on FanDuel right now. I'll, like, McElroy missed the eagle putt, but he made the, the birdie, so he's six under. Bogey free 67 today. I'll bet you you're getting him. They probably adjusted the odds back up to, like, plus 600, 700. Really? A hundred percent, because now they're like, this guy's coming. This guy's, like, yeah, he's going to do if some he's here for the But weekend, what could you have got him at yesterday? Well, plus 1,000. Like, going into the tournament, you're paying, like, it's like plus 400, plus 450. Terrible odds for a golf tournament because right. he's so good. Right. And as much as there are other very good players, it's the same thing with Rom. Like, Rom down in Mexico at the Mexican, it was like plus 350 or something. Wow. Finau ended up winning. But Scheffler, too. If Scheffler's in a tournament where Rory's not there, Rom's not there, you, you're getting no odds because it's right. just everyone kind of expects those guys to contend and certainly be in it and possibly – close but uh let's look that up on fando let's see where the live odds are odds are on on mcelroy uh if he's six under and he's three up the pace so I, I would guess he's he's probably in a good situation um what am i seeing here plus 500 now so at one point he was plus 1300 according to our boy normie love it but mcelroy is now plus 500 so graham to smart play plus a yeah. thousand now it's only plus 500 that's a, that, that's Make That's manipulation of, of the books, man. Sprinkle Graham Dillette, not his first rodeo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He knows what he's doing. Um, all right, Dear Hazy B, in just under an hour, we're live at the RBC Canadian Open. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. All right, Dear Hazy B coming up in about 45 minutes. It's a Friday. We're at Oakdale Golf and Country Club, the RBC Canadian Open. A lot of action. A lot of things happening out here. Roy McIlroy yeah. is now in the clubhouse at 6 under. Corey Connors. Is uh, still out there, I believe, but he is at seven under. Adam Hadwin, clubhouse, five under. So we got some big names, some heavy hitters. We love it. Um, hockey news keeps coming, man, even with the cup final taking place. Yeah. Kevin Weeks of ESPN reporting that uh, Ryan Huska will be the next head coach out in Calgary. Another one of Jason Strudwick's former teammates. So Shane Doan. Uh uh, you know, AGM. No, what is it? Special He's assistant, assistant to, to the GM. Brad Tree Living. And then Ryan Huska, another Kamloops guy, played with Tux and uh, was assistant coach to Daryl the last couple of years. So, right. you know, he's been uh, kind of groomed within the organization. So that's Craig Conroy's first move as a general manager. That's yeah. right. 
Yeah. So. And it could work. It, like sometimes the players, and God knows what these players, some of them that didn't perform, God knows what they want or what they're looking for. And it could be good because he knows everyone and the relationships, who knows what they're worth. But it, it, there's also a chance it could be too much of the same, and there's not a response. So good well, luck to him. Well, you hope that – here's the thing. You hope that – Ryan Huska has his own style, and he probably has – well, not probably. He has a relationship with those guys because he was the assistant coach the last couple of years. So, mm. you know, it, you're stepping into that chair as the number one guy, not the – you know, sometimes it's good cop, bad cop type of thing. But he, his coaching style, he's got to bring that to the table. And, you know, they're going to have to now replace him. So they'll probably bring in an associate, maybe a veteran guy to help along with the process. But, you know, it's an internal hire. They have a. They had the coach of the year in the AHL as well as Mitch Love. Right, who was there. And, well, and they coach of the year in the NHL the year before was Daryl Sutter. Yeah. So I mean, they're regardless, Jamie. He's got a big job to turn those guys around to play yeah, better. Yeah, they're great, and well, they all better be dialed yeah. in. And yeah. I, I think you know it, yeah. it was loud. It was it was a radioactive uh, right. yeah. kind of season out there. I would say. Yeah. And, exactly. You know, with Sutter, it, it obviously didn't go well. It got to a point where they let him go. Right. And. I would assume the players were probably pretty loud on that. You know, you got to believe in in the exit meetings and possibly in the introductory meetings with Conroy. Right. Hey, this we didn't love this, we didn't love that, and you know, take that for what it's worth with Ryan Huska. That, that not that he was going to plan on being Daryl Sutter anyway. Right. But it's probably going to be very different vibe around that team. Oh, big time. Compared to the way Sutter operated, and Sutter didn't change. No. Sutter had always been the same. He was, you know him. He was yeah. your guy, like your coach. Like that's yeah. how he operated. Some people like it. Some people don't. Certainly not considered a player's coach. Never has been at any point in his career. But he wins. Successful coach. Always and, successful. And, and at some point, it heck, runs out, and it ran out, and he's gone. And now Huska steps in, and he's going to be different. He has to be different. Exactly. And his coaching style be interesting to see what he does with that group. But ultimately, Craig Conroy has to. You know, he's got some work ahead of him, just like Brad Tree Living has. You know, Brad Tree Living's going to have to make a decision on his coaching staff as well and replace Spencer Carberry. Sure. So there's, you know. That's, well, wouldn't that be Sheldon Keith's job if he's the if he's the head coach? I mean, he'd have a say in who's going to be on his bench, the, I, I would you're think. Right, but, I, you know, again, you look at the Flames situation, they missed the playoffs. So right. there's lots of work to be done there. Now, is the work internal where you – have a team in place you're just asking them to play better that's the other thing too Jonathan Huberto had 50 what do you 58 points this yeah. year 56 the, points as big of a drop off as we've ever seen Almost in NHL like, history exactly ever so, you know and and Lynn Holm you go right down Mangiapane they all had a step back Nazem Kadri wins a cup and I don't know if he really got going there like he had a decent season but not his top tier season right so Right away, you're going to ask that group or whoever's coming back to play better. Sure. Including Markstrom. The goalie wasn't good. A absolutely. No, there's a lot of kind of question marks in the air around the Canadian markets. Like, we, we've covered what's happening in Toronto and what could happen in Toronto and where they're going to yeah, take it all. Yeah. And at this point, it's it's completely undetermined. But you got Pierre-Luc Dubois in Winnipeg, who has made it clear he's not signing. Basically, I want out. Like, he's yeah. effectively doing what Kachuk did a, a year ago yeah and it sounds as if he's going to get flipped and then you got alex to in, in ottawa yeah sounds like doing the same thing but there are some reports kind of conflicting that that i've seen online that yeah. maybe he wants to stick around maybe he likes the head coach i don't know but wouldn't he like, have told ottawa that before and i know you can't like block a trade if you have no trades or whatever but wouldn't he say, listen guys you're going to dump a bunch of prospects and stuff for me it's not going to happen so don't bother I don't know. I don't it know. may not have mattered because well, Ottawa, you know, controls your rights. That's what comes yeah, with being they, a pro athlete. And Ottawa probably thinking we're going to try to sell him on the program. Right. right? And, yeah. and and the thing, too, is he's still a, a controllable asset. Right. But you have to make your decision now before he gets with to a point. qualifying offers and all that stuff. Qualifying offer. And if he's not willing to sign a long-term deal, you've got to move him. Like that's you, I don't think you let him play it out, and you can't walk to free agency. You've right. got to, you've got to sort that situation out. And looming in all of that is, I think we all believe there'd be a new owner in place, and sorting that situation out. I don't know. Like the news, it's been weird. All of a sudden, the news just shows up, 
in the NHL. You haven't seen a lot. All of a sudden, it just yeah. Hey, we got a new GM or Kyle Dubas not in that. Now it's a new GM here and new new coach over there and uh, Babcock just resurfaces. That's just, a, that might be the craziest one of them all. Like he he had been linked to right. Columbus. Like there have been reports on that. Insider trading's been on it. That yeah. And we all knew that his money was about to expire up here. His contract was about to expire, but. You compare and contrast the noise around him coming up here from Detroit to him going to Columbus, and obviously a large portion of that is the market involved. 100%. Toronto versus Columbus without question. But this is a guy who was a no-brainer head coach in 2010, no-brainer head coach in 2014 of the Olympic team, won a cup, been to multiple cup finals, and he just kind of slides in through the back door in Columbus. Yeah. Like now all of a sudden, and that's probably exactly what he wanted. Well, I think so. I think he wants a quiet, like whenever Mike Babcock's name has come up over the last three or four years, a lot of it has been negative. Well, you know, a lot of it has been about his relationship with players and how, yeah. how difficult he can be on some guys. And now he's in Columbus, and it's not even official yet because it can't be until July 1st. Well, he's going to squeeze so it every might be penny. a good fit in my workout. Well, I'm not saying it around. won't. Yeah. I, think, I, I think it will be a good fit. It I'm just was... saying that's a, that's a big, like, a different example, different context. But if and when Joel Quinville gets back, that'll be a, a very loud story. Very. It'll be broken down. He gets clearance. Now he's available. Yeah. He's interviewing here. Babcock, it was just completely yeah. quiet, and then it's, oh, he's going well, to Columbus. He had a line for the profile of Mike yeah. Babcock. Absolutely. Oh, this yeah. is a, a borderline, hall, probably a Hall of Fame coach Absolutely who was is. the head coach of our national team in two of the most triumphant runs in our sports history, yeah. 2010, 2014. Head coach of the Leafs. And it's just, oh, yeah, oh, well, Babs in Columbus? Oh, wow, I, that's wild stuff. I think he likes And you're the, moving on. I think he likes it being under the radar. He does, for sure. Because he had a noisy departure. Yes. But you know what? You look at it, and I think we've talked about it before. Sheldon Keefe with that same group as they ended up continuing to mature, he almost sounded like Babcock on some of those nights where he's like, yeah, you know. Like alluding to maturity. But that's because the team to, was the team. But but that's what I'm saying is there's people that are like, maybe Babcock was right all along that these guys needed to find a little bit more jam in their game, needed to find some of these things. Doesn't, you know, absolve some of the things that happened or some of the things that I think he regrettably said or did. Sure. But, you know, he's – I come back to it like – Regardless of whether you like the person or not, he's a hell of a coach. Absolutely. And and that's where, you know, it's it's a big story, but it's going to be quiet. Until he rolls through town for the first time. Until he rolls through town, exactly. Because like, you're not going to be tuning in every night to see if Columbus is no. winning or losing. But Well, he will be because he's – Well, he's got skin in like the game. Like people are tweeting in, your Columbus Blue Jackets are really moving and shaking. And they're tweeting at you saying, bad, bad, hazy B, yeah. watch out. That is right. valid. I am, I'm getting some backlash already. It's June 9th. And we're, <laughs> we're everyone's flip flopping on the on you know Columbus. the idea that Columbus could be a competitive team. I but love it. Like I don't think a coach can decline to speak to the media. Uh, you can't do that. Like if when Babcock gets to Toronto, he's going to step up. That'll be the first time. Right. Like no one's no one's talked to him on the record. Like he's done a couple of interviews here or there. But that scrum is going to be massive when he gets up here for the first time. It'll be massive, yeah. And you, you just wonder where the direction of that is going to go. Is the Mitch story going to come up and pop back up? Who knows? People, but that's what I'm saying. Like the public relations of Columbus, which I will say as an organization, I think do an incredible job of making their people accessible. Using our show as an example. When we reach out, generally they they hook up people. Yeah, John Davidson's come on. Davidson's like, been on. We had Rick Nash on. We've had you've had Yarmo on the station. Players on the station, um, and with Babcock, you know, I could see them trying to kind of protect him a little bit during the presser when he gets up here. Yet he may take on that challenge, and he's going to be Mike Babcock. He's going to say what he's going to say. He's going to do what he's going to do. Yeah. Probably try to crack a joke that won't necessarily land. And then that'll right. be it. And once you go through it the first time, it'll be over. Exactly. Right? He could be down there for a decade. Once you come here the first time, that's the story. It's over. Yeah. The next time, it'll be, oh, it's just Mike Babcock, the coach in Columbus. Exactly. Right? Nothing, exactly. Nothing's going to really change there. Yeah. So, um, all right, we still got some heavy hitters out there on, on the course. We're up here at Oakdale, RBC Canadian Open. Uh, as we said, McElroy birdied 18. He went 500 today, bogey-free, 600 for the tournament. Tyrrell Hatton is eight under. He had himself. He a, must have dialed it in the back nine or something. He was eight under today. 
He was even par. Wow. Coming into the round, he shot a 64. Uh, I believe that's the low round of the day. I mean, that, that is that's impressive. phenomenal scoring for Tyrrell Hatton. So we got some big names. My man, Garrick Higo, Jerry Higo, love him. Yeah. Right, he's up there. He's he's feeling it. So Jerry it's all Higo good. with the tight pants, the lefty. Absolutely, Jerry Higo, four under for the tournament, and uh, he's feeling himself. He's T20 right now. Final hour coming up. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app.